Hello everybody, this is Deacon Sakona Prince of the Liberty Missionary Baptist Church where the Reverend Dr. Clyde May Jr. is our pastor. And we're going to be reviewing the Sunday School lesson coming out of Faith Pathways books. But with that being said, let us get started in a word of prayer. So let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus. Lord, thank you for another opportunity to gather together and study your word. Lord, we ask right now that you would give us wisdom and insight as we go into the scriptures today. And God, allow this lesson to soak deep down in our heart and in our soul, that we may be better sons and better daughters and better servants of you. Allow us to let our light so shine before men that they may say our good works, but give you glory which is in heaven by God coming to know you in the pardon of their sins. We thank you and we praise you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so our lesson today is going to be lesson number 12. The date is February 20th, 2022, and we're in a unit three. And our unit subject is justice and adversity. Our lesson subject is enduring false charges. Our devotional reading comes from James chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Our background scripture is Job chapter 8. And our printed passage is Job chapter 8, verses 1 through 10, and verses 20 through 22. The key verse reads, Then answered Bildad and Sheha, and said, How long wilt thou speak these things? And how long shall the word of thy mouth be like a strong wind? Job chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Our lesson name states that as a result of experience this lesson, you should be able to do these things, understand Bildad's response to Job's suffering, Carefully discern when others misinterpret God's ways and grow closer to God and live faithfully in God's just ways. And you know it, say it with me, it's glasses time. The introduction says, why does God allow tragedies? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do the righteous suffer afflictions while the unjust or unrighteous go unaffected? Humankind has wrestled with these and other questions about pain, suffering, and social injustice. Inevitably, he will experience pain and suffering as, to some degree. Explanations for this inevitable experience range from fate to blaming God. Some even ask, if God is this all powerful being, why does he or how or would he allow pain and suffering to exist? Perhaps the most familiar and studied biblical account of this dilemma is Job's experience with suffering. In his culture, the reasoning of the Jews, prosperity was a sign of God's blessing, while suffering was a result of sin in an individual's life. Job's immediate friends held this concept and repeated, repeatedly tried to convince him that he was suffering because he had committed some sin against God. But believers realized that God's character prevents him from being vindictive and causing suffering. God's attributes include unconditional love, mercy, and compassion. If he were to cause, if he was the cause of pain and suffering, it would be a contradiction of his eternal nature. He may permit suffering in our lives for his purposes and our good, but he is not the cause of it. Adversity in our lives is often al allowed to enhance our spiritual growth. We may be unable to provide satisfactory responses to those who challenge our faith in this area. What we can do is respond with empathy, sympathy, and acts of compassion, compassionate benevolence, and point them to the one who is the God of all comfort and understanding. That is so, so true. The analysis of the biblical text says the first section is a faulty conclusion. Job chapter 8, verses 1 through 7. And the word of the Lord reads, then answered Bildad and Shuhit, and said, How long wilt thou speak these things, and how long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? Do God pervert judgment, or do the Almighty pervert justice? If any children have sinned against him, he have cast them away 
for their transgressions. If thou wouldest seek unto God's like for times and make thy supplications to the Almighty, if thou wert pure and upright, surely now he would awake for thee and make the habitation of the righteous prosperous. Though thy beginnings were small, yet thy latter's end should greatly increase. The commentary says, after Job's friends, Ephelias, Bildad, and Zophar heard about his intense suffering, they came to console him. What should have been a time of comforting compassion soon became one of disagreement, condemnation, and accusation. Eliphaz was the first to speak and launch the argument that God would not destroy the righteous. Consequently, he responded, Job had no right to complain about his condition and should accept it if he, if he had and should accept it if he had not sinned. Bildiad's first speech was blunt and to the point of his personal theology about God and humankind. He accused Job outright for like, defying his innocence with a lot of hot air. He reasoned that Job's suffering was a direct circumstance of sin in his life. Bildad asked Job two questions to support his accusations and his faulty conclusions. He asked, will God perverse judgment? Will the Almighty perverse justice? It is inconceivable that Bildad, to Bildad that Job could, could accuse the Almighty God, El Shaddai, of perverting justice. He concluded that God was punishing Job because he had sinned. To believe otherwise would mean God had perverted his ways. Heartlessly, Bildad told Job that even the death of his children was a consequence of some sin against God. This was a heart-rending accusation for this grieving father who made sacrifices to God for, his, for, for their hidden sins. According to, Bibli according to Bildad's theology, Job had only one recourse, admit that he was suffering as a result of sin in his life. He advised Job to seek God instead of expecting God to search for him. If, if Job was the righteous man he claimed to be, then, then God would bless him and make his, prosperous, make his prosperity greater in the future than it had been in the past. Build that theology was flawed. He recognized the omnipotence and immutability of God. He f his failure was not to consider the possibility of his forgiving sins and restoring the repentant sin sinner. His reasoning was simply cause and effect. Do good and good things follow. Do bad and bad things follow. Believers, believers must avoid exhibiting the kind of judgment, judgmental attitude Bildad had in assuming that those who are suffering are guilty of sin. God is the author of justice and does not and will not pervert it with a vindictive like retribution. He does not overlook or condone sin and will judge it fairly and issue consequences for it. It is also critical for believers to avoid casting the first stone at those whose sin is blatant and considered their guilt in God's sight. Bildad's ideal about God were not based on sound doctrinal teaching about him or his ways. Therefore, if, if believers are to effectively and compassionately assist the suffering, that we need a thorough knowledge of God's word. Well, you know, there was something else that really stuck out to me while I was reading this passage of scripture, and it came in that um, in that sixth verse where it says, if thou wert pure and upright, surely now he would awake for thee. He would awake for thee. It's if God was asleep. As if God was somewhere and didn't know what was going on. 
Um, again, it's a dangerous thing to misconstrue God's word and to pull it out of context, context and really not even know the nature and in fact, the heart of God. Um, and these were supposed to, I mean, these are Joe's friends, you know, they weren't his enemies. They were his friends, but they were doing a horrible job of consoling him. Uh, and I think too, you know, their, 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 their envy showed, you know, they were in a place of, in their mind, judgment of Job, probably because of how blessed he was. And I believe the actual envy is what kind of drove and pushed them, you know, to make these accusations. Um, but we really don't know the tone that they took with him other than what we see in the word of God. We don't know the face expressions. In fact, we don't know how close they were, you know, if they were talking down to him, if they were talking condescending. All we know is the words that they were sharing. But they had a faulty conclusion. They really didn't understand. And, you know, there are points when you don't know what to say. You just shouldn't say anything. Where your silence and your presence is enough. But sometimes people feel like they have to say something, you know, they have to put something out there. You know, there, there are people that have something to say. And then there are people that have to say something. Uh, but in a situation like this, it's best to be led of God in your response and, and how you deal with the situation. Because most of us, you know, we'll just try to judge stuff based upon what we see and, and what we understand. And oftentimes it's kind of skewed. You know, it's not spot on. And so we need to ask for discernment and, and ask the Lord to guide us in how we are to approach a situation circumstances, a person, so that we don't come off like, like Job's friends, judgmental. Because no one needs that, especially when they are going through, they need, you know, the, the, the encouragement. They need the, the peace of God. And if we're not, if God didn't tell us to go there and to confront them and to actually, you know, if God didn't give us a word to give to them, best thing for us to do is to pray, pray for them and pray for even God. What do you, what is it that you have me to say? And I can tell you, there have been times in my own life when I've been talking to people and they've been, they've been, they've been talking to me and, and going through some stuff. And, and before I, I just pull out my definition or my answer to that question, I, was, I will silently pray within myself, Lord, give me what to say. And in those times, God gives us, the Holy Spirit gives us what it is that we need to be sharing with them and what they really need to hear, especially in those times that are just so, uh, so pressing to them. And so I want us to make sure that that's us, that we're not trying to force feed someone our opinion or our thought process, especially when it comes to things of God. And when they need the help and the guidance, we have to make sure that we do our part in actually helping them to become the people that God intended for them to be. In fact, the second commentary says faulty traditionalism. Job chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. And the word of the Lord reads, For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to the search of, thy, of their fathers. For we are but of yesterday, and know nothing, because our days upon the earth are a shadow. Shall not they teach thee and tell thee and utter words out of their heart? The commentary says that traditionalism that refers to the upholding or maintenance of tradition, especially to resist change. A traditionalist is a person who believes the old ways are best. Bill Dad was a traditionalist who looked to the wisdom of the past to frame his thinking. He approached his approach in, in addressing Job's suffering was to was a product of the tradition of karma, the secular belief that one's actions that determine his or her fate. He his support he supported his philosophy by like referring to Job to what 
the ancients had to say about his dilemma. Bildad based his position of the accumulated wisdom of the past. It was synonymous with telling Job, what I am telling you has been recognized throughout the ages. He reasoned that the longevity of the partnership gave them, of the patriarchs, gave them more time to evaluate life's truth. Therefore, they had much to teach Job if he would l listen to their wisdom. We can learn from the past, but can, but because something was said or written years ago does not make it credible or the thing to do. Bildad was a prisoner of the past. He, he allowed it to influence his belief about God and his relationship with humankind. Holding to traditional ideas about the correlation between sin and suffering caused him to insult, criticize, and accuse an upright man of sinning against God. Bildad's attitude and behavior proved that, that he respected the wisdom of the past more than the teaching of his contemporaries. Moving forward, like believers must distinguish between tradition and traditionalism. Traditions looks back on the faith that those like before us and uses it to inform and guide the future. Traditionalism is stagnant and resistant to change, holding on to ideas and practices that are out of step with the present. The task of maintaining justice during times of adversity while in fact remain faithful to God requires dependency on the inherent and infallible word of God. We look back, we will, if we look back, we will discover that God's word was the tradition of the elders. So, not only did we have a faulty conclusion, we also had a faulty traditionalism. Taking a position of what goes around comes around and just weighing Job's situation with no true understanding as to what was going on, it really, it puts his friends in a bad position f for them to use their own wisdom, their own philosophy. I know they think that they were trying to help Job, but I really can't see that being the case. Because when you truly care about somebody, you want to offer them a solution and not accuse them of certain things. So not really understanding they were on shaky ground in their accusations against him. And what they said really didn't have any weight. It didn't have any truth to it. And because of it, they found themselves uh, really, they were, they were painting God in a bad light. And in the end, God told Job he had to pray for them, you know. Um, but we, if we can learn anything from this lesson is that we, we need not to be like Job's friends and just assume we have all the answers, assume we know exactly what's going on, assume we know exactly what to do. Because the reality is without God's help, none of us can make it. All of us fall short. And there are times when God does things that really we don't fully understand, but we have to be honest enough with ourselves to know, okay, I'm having to trust him in this because I don't know what's going on. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do, but I know that he does. And that's where our faith in him should shine bright as the noonday sun. Even when we're trying to help somebody and we're trying to get them to a point of relief and release, we need to know that we are trusting in the one who is able to do anything but fail. And we need to help encourage them to trust him as well. Because what it is about living this Christian life is everything has to be done with a measure of faith. You know, because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if we want to please him, we have to trust him and we have to act accordingly. It's not just our belief, but our actions based on those beliefs. It really is the catalyst for us seeing the change and the difference that God intended for us to. And not just for us seeing it, but for us being able to model it, even in front, even in front of other people. Because they are looking too. They are looking to see how are you going to react? How are you going to respond with everything that's happening to you? And you can imagine Job's silence as he sat there and these people were just beating him up. They were tag teaming. They were taking turns 
beating him up, but yet and still, he sinned not against God with his mouth. That says something about his integrity. So don't you let that marinate for a minute. In the words of the psalm, say la. All right, our next section says a faulty verdict. Job chapter 8, verses 20 through 21. And the word of the Lord reads, Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man, neither will he help the evildoers, till he filled like thy mouth with the laughing and thy lips with rejoicing. They that hate thee shall be clothed in shame, and the dwelling place of the wicked shall come to naught. The commentary says, Faulty theology and faulty traditionalism produces faulty conclusions. Bill Dad summarized his first speech by repeating his initial judgment. God will not cast away a perfect man, nor help evildoers. His faulty verdict was that Job was a righteous, was a righteous man who had fallen into sin and was suffering because of it. Bill Dad expressed confidence that God would not forsake Job if he repented. If Job repented, then the benefits would, in the benefits he would receive would be, number one, a reversal of his fortunes by producing a mouthful of laughter and rejoicing, and number two, to witness his enemies shamed and destroyed. It is clear that Bill Dad misunderstood God's justice. This misunderstanding hurt instead of like relieving Job's emotion and mental, and mental stress caused by his suffering and loss. Bildad's failure lay in, in knowing about God, but not having an intimate relationship with him. He continued to argue that justice will, was being fairly administered in Job's situation. He based his conclusion on what he had on what he could see on what he could see instead of a spiritual discernment available to those who have experienced the love of God and who are knowledgeable of his word. Hurting and suffering people all around us in our homes, communities, and places of corporate <laughs> worship. They in fact require the ministry of like believers who have strived to meet their needs without passing judgment and whose words and actions are a product of sound biblical teaching, genuine compassion, and empathetic understanding. That last sentence really says a lot because we can really damage somebody by not uh, representing God in the best light. It can become a source of pain and hurt for those individuals to who have not yet experienced God love or who, or who could be going through something that they don't understand, even even as a believer. But we have to be able to compassionately encourage them to trust in the Lord with all their heart and lean not to their own understanding and all their ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct that path, even in a bad situation. So we can't just assume that we know exactly what God is doing, because if we knew exactly, exactly what he was doing, we would be God. We have to trust him. And I was thinking about this just in fact the other day. You know, the scripture say, and all that getting, get understanding. Well, some of that understanding should be that we don't understand everything. <laughs> Some of the understanding should be that we understand God is God and we are human. God is infinite. We are finite. But we can trust him in spite of what we don't know. And our pastor oftentimes says this, we can trust God when we can't trace him. So can we do that today? Can that be a part of who we are? And can we model that for other people? Not only in our own lives, but in theirs as well. So having these kind of faulty verdicts, having these kind of faulty conclusions, they really... They don't help the situation. They further push people away from God instead of encouraging them to trust God in spite of what they're facing and what they're going through. The section that says a closing thought. It says misunderstanding, in fact, the ways of God is directly related to failure to know and understand his word. The responsibility of, of in fact, ministering in fact, to those dealing with suffering that like magnifies when like, believers are not familiar with 
with or well versed in biblical teachings on suffering. A simple answer to the whys of human suffering is not found especially in the Bible. However, the Bible does contain enough insight to point those who suffer to God, who is the source of comfort and justice. Our responsibility is to discover those truths and be prepared to minister effectively and compassionately when opportunities arise. Again, that's knowing the character of God and being able to point people to that as a source of comfort and not a source of condemnation. The section that says, for your life, how prepared are you to minister to someone who like, misinterprets God's ways, especially when suffering and injustice are involved? Bill Dad's counsel failed because of a flawed theology. We cannot be guilty of making like, this mistake. Commit to begin and continue to engage in purposeful Bible study so that you will be effectively equipped to help others recognize like misinterpretations and like misunderstandings about God's justice. Amen. Section that says your world. We do not have to go far to discover someone struggling with the issue of suffering. Various forms of injustice cause quite a, quite a, a, a bit of suffering that we see in our experiences. Like believers have the responsibility of ministering to the suffering and distress with compassion and, and empathy. These virtues are a product of having a personal, obedient, and intimate relationship with God. This kind of relationship requires spending time in His presence through His Word and fervent prayer. Submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit and allow Him to assist you in helping somebody persevere through their suffering and pain this week. Amen. The closing prayer says, God, help us draw closer to you so that in like, difficult times we will be mindful of your comfort and justice. And with that compassion, like, we can point others to you in their time of suffering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So again, this particular lesson talks about the importance of us being able to endure false charges. Enduring false charges. It talks about it from Job's standpoint, but it talks more about the friends that were accusing him. The subject is enduring false charges, so that's us enduring the charges that are levied against us. But the scriptures pointed to the fact that his friends were the ones levying those accusations against him. So we need not to be like his friends. And I know none of us want to be like Job, but at some point in our life, we will experience some level of suffering. The question is, how do we respond? Do we run to God for a hiding place in a time of trouble, in a time of storm? Or do we accuse God of being the one that caused it? Now, again, we've talked about how God allows it, but he's not the cause of it. And even in his allowing it is for us to, to draw closer to him. The question is, how are we going to respond? Are we going to, to draw closer to God or are we going to find every excuse to blame him for our current situation? Now, I, I don't want you to be misled into thinking that, that there aren't any consequences to our sin because they are. But even in that, God is compassionate and you know, the more I study God's word, the more I can just see his heart, how God wants us to win. Someone said, if God knew that Adam and Eve were going to sin, why did he put the tree in the garden? Well, if you look at it closely, look at the odds. He didn't say you can't eat from any other tree but this one. He didn't say you can eat from half of these trees and other ones you can't. He said you can eat of all the trees except this one. God stacked it in our favor. That shows me his heart and how much he cares for us. God loves us and he wants to see us win. He wants to see us succeed. He wants to see us be the person he called us to be so we can reach a dying world. So we need not to accuse him of, of bringing hurt, harm and danger to someone because that's not in his character. But when it does happen, he's there to relieve. He's there to rescue. He's there to make a difference. And we owe it to the people that we're ministering to, to point them in that direction. 
So listen, this lesson, it reminds me of how there are times we're going to have to endure false charges. But we also know that God is a vindicator. He is the one that makes everything right. In his time, we just have to trust him to get that done. So with that being said, I do want to close in a word of prayer. So let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you right now for this opportunity to study your word and for all the many blessings you've given us. Thank you for everything that you've done and continue to do on our behalf. Father, we ask right now that you would just give us a mind to be able to share with your people the fact that you are still in the miracle working business. And regardless of what they're facing or going through, what they're suffering or dealing with, they can trust you in spite of what it looks like. God, we know that you are well able to do anything but fail. And God, there's no shadow of turning in you. God, we know right now that you have a plan for us to bring us to an expected end. God, help us to trust you even in the midst of uncertain times, even in the midst of uncertain situations and circumstances. We know that you are still on the throne and you're still in control. God, give us the peace of knowing that, God, you are working on our behalf. And God, you are you are bringing us to that place you will have us to be. Father, we just thank you right now for all the many blessings you've given us and for everything that you've done because you have been there day in and day out when we were thinking about you and when we weren't. You have been a blessing to us. Thank you, Father. Thank you for forgiving us for our sins, for creating in us a clean heart and renewing the right spirit within us. Help us today, Lord God, to be that beacon light of hope for those who don't know you in the part of their sins. God, use us to help encourage those who are in, even in the body of Christ, who may be dealing with Lord, tragedy and loss and suffering and hurt and pain, help us not be judgmental. But God, help us to be an instrument in your hands to God to show your love to a dying world. And we thank you right now. We praise you. We worship you. We magnify you. We lift you up and we honor you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We pray and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Man, well, listen, look, this is Mendeek Zaccone, Prince of the Liberty Missionary Baptist Church, or the Reverend Dr. Clyde May Jr. is our pastor. As I always want to thank Pastor May for allowing us this opportunity and time to share this Sunday school lesson with you. I also want to thank God for my co labor in this endeavor, Reverend Frederick Robinson, how he does a masterful job of sharing, in fact, the lessons as only God can give to him. Then I also want to thank Deacon L.K. Winbush, the superintendent of our Sunday school, for the role he plays in helping us to learn more and to get gain more knowledge in God's word. And I also want to thank God for my wife and my children who are, are nothing but a blessing to me day in and day out. In spite of what I may say sometimes, they are. And I also want to thank God for allowing me to be one, part of one of his greatest churches, the Liberty Missionary Baptist Church. And listen, we actually would like and share this video so somebody else can get this valuable information of how they can endure false charges. With that being said, we'll talk to you later. God bless. Bye.